Hello and welcome to Mary Live. This is Dr. Mark Miravalli. My friends, the church in her wisdom celebrates every September 15th the feast, the memorial of the sorrows of Our Lady. I want to start with a, with a key question. Why would the church emphasize the sorrows of Jesus' mother? What possible value could that have for you and for me today, 21st century, in the midst of our own challenges, which sometimes seem ubiquitous, they seem to be everywhere. Well, I want to start by going back to a 13th century hymn, a poem, a sequence that is known as the Stabat Mater. Literally, the mother was standing. And this is taken from John 19, 26 to 27. It is a meditation on the truth of what's going on in Mary's heart as she is there experiencing the sufferings of Jesus. I ask you just to prayerfully listen to these words. I'm going to go through the first 15 stanzas of these and see what it says to us. And again, the overriding question, why does the church proclaim, acknowledge, testify, underscore, appreciate the sufferings of the mother? At the cross, her station keeping, stood the mournful mother weeping, close to her son to the last. Through her heart, his sorrow sharing, all his bitter anguish bearing, now at length the sword has passed. Oh, how sad and sore distressed was that mother, highly blessed of the soul begotten one. Christ above in torment hangs. She beneath beholds the pangs of her dying glorious son. Is there one who would not weep, whelmed in miseries so deep, Christ's dear mother to behold? Can the human heart refrain from partaking in her pain, in that mother's pain untold? For the sins of his own nation saw him hang in desolation, till his spirit forth he sent. She, beneath her tender child, saw him hang. O thou mother, font of love, touch my spirit from above, make my heart with thine accord. Make me feel as thou hast felt. Make my soul to glow and melt with the love of Christ my Lord. Holy Mother, pierce me through. In my heart, each wound renew of my Savior crucified. Let me share with thee his pain, who for all my sins was slain, who for me in torments died. Let me mingle tears with thee. Mourning him who mourned for me all the days that I may live by the cross with thee to stay, there with thee to weep and pray is all I ask of thee to give. Virgin of all virgins blessed, listen to my fond request. Let me share thy grief divine. And it goes on for another five stanzas. Doing what, my friends? First of all, acknowledging that what went on in the heart of the mother was an existential, that is, a true lived experience of what's happening in the heart of son at, uh, at Calvary. And the more we understand what's going on with the mother, the more we must proclaim it. The more we must testify. Why? Because of the rest of the sequence and the rest of the reality of today. We are undergoing this pain. Calvary is not something we go back to. Calvary is something that's brought to us. There's great joy in this life. There's great blessings. There's also a valley of tears. And in our present moment of human history, it's not hard for us to list our litany of woes. 
There's challenges going on. And we're all dealing with those challenges at different levels of spiritual strength and courage and maturity or the lack thereof. That's why the church proclaims the sufferings of the mother. Essentially for two reasons, ultimately. First of all, as we'll see, heaven wants us to proclaim the sufferings of the mother. Heaven wants us to acknowledge the sufferings of the mother. And only by doing so will we receive the graces necessary to endure our passion and death individually as a church, leading to a time of resurrection, leading to an era of peace, leading to a new springtime of the church, as the Roman pontiffs have articulated. But it's also, it's also because we need that witness. We need the example of the sorrowing mother. It's somewhat interesting that we have the endless ad hominem, the endless attack, the heresy, the, the, uh, the, the logical fallacy of saying, but that's Christ. That's God. Of course he's suffering well. He's kind of God. Don't expect me to do what Jesus did on the cross. Don't expect me to be God. I'm not God. Fair enough in a secondary sense, because ultimately, he's not asking us to be him. He's asking us to be us with him so we can endure our crosses. But in this context, we cannot make that ad hominem. We can't make that fallacious, illogical reference to the mother of Jesus. Mary was and still is in the glories of heaven entirely human. She's the human mother, and that's why she becomes the ultimate exemplar of how we are to suffer. And my friends, in truth and in love, it would be naive to think that our sufferings are over. I think there's many things that would point in a general sense to say, your sufferings and my sufferings will continue. They might get more intense. That should not cause us any lacking of consolation because we have the grace to do it, we have the example to do it, and ultimately, ultimately, if we acknowledge the, the role of the mother, the sufferings of the co-redemptrix, as we shed, there will be an overflow, a great excess, a great generosity of heavenly graces for us to patiently endure, to suffer with, and to conquer with Jesus, the victorious King, uh, and Our Lady, the victorious Queen, of all that comes in our time. So this September 15th feast that the Church celebrates is certainly not supposed to be a once-a-year event, but it does call us in a special way to remember that the mother's suffering has an untold value for us to ponder. Well, you know, one might say, well, okay, the mother the suffering, you know, uh, this happened 2,000 years ago, and, you know, we remember this in, on a day of the sorrowful mother, at least liturgically. But where's the ink? Where's, where's the foundation for this? Is this really something biblical? Is it really something the church accepts in tradition? Is it something the popes teach? Or is this just kind of a understandable, but perhaps less founded Catholic pietism? Is it, you know, excessive emotion regarding Mary? Well, let's summarize a proper response to that question, and let's go through 20 centuries in a few minutes. We start with Scripture. And we start in the Old Testament, the mother of Maccabees, 2 Maccabees 7, the mother who had seven sons killed before her because they all would not betray the covenant. And then the mother is killed. Well, that's the prophecy of the seven sorrows of Our Lady. And it's also a prophecy of her spiritual crucifixion at Calvary as well. We move into the New Testament and we have Mary saying yes to the Archangel Gabriel. She brings us the Redeemer as Mother Teresa and other saints say, of course she's co-redemptive by that alone, by that alone, by giving us the Redeemer 
it just doesn't stop there. And we move on to Luke 2.35 with the prophecy of Simeon saying, Jesus will be a sign of contradiction. And secondly, to Mary, your heart too will be pierced. That's an explicit biblical reference to the truth and the value of Mary's co-suffering with Jesus. This is brought in climax at John 19, 25 through 27. Jesus is killed physically. Mary is crucified spiritually. The medievals would say they did it as one heart. How does the early church understand this? Well, the model of the new Eve, St. Irenaeus, 165, uh, along with a later teaching, uh, the, the further teaching of Irenaeus, really starts with Justin the martyr. And then Irenaeus, continuing in 185, saying essentially, what Eve does through disobedience, Mary does through obedience, and literally calls her in 185, the quote, cause of salvation for herself and the whole human race. Second century Mariology. By the fifth century, liturgy, Coptic, Armenian. Eastern liturgies refer to Mary as the source instrument of redemption because, and only because, she brings us Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate source, the ultimate cause. But as Mother Teresa would say many centuries later, remember, no Mary, no Jesus. And then we continue through the first millennium. In the 10th century, you have St. John the Geometer, uh, the Byzantine monk, who says, Jesus and Mary experienced everything together, and they redeemed us together. You have the title Corredemptrix, which, uh, Redemptrix, just Redemptrix, which appears first in the 10th century. Sancta Redemptrix, or Pronobis. Two centuries later, we have St. Bernard and his disciple Arnold, who will say Mary experienced compassion with Jesus, suffered with Jesus. Mary offered Jesus to the Father. And in the words of Arnold, Mary was co-crucified with Jesus at Calvary. 14th century, the title co-redemptrix, meaning only, my friends, that Mary uniquely shares in the sufferings of Jesus. It never means that Mary is equal to Jesus. Blasphemy and heresy. This continues in the 16th century. The, the most famous theologian of the Council of Trent, Salmeron, defends Mary's role as co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate. The next century, the 17th century, has been called the golden age of Mary's the co-redemptrix. 300 times theologians, priests, mystics defend Mary's role with Jesus and the redemption. And remember, this is just an echo of the mystical tradition. Great saints like St. Saint Bridget of Sweden, who heard from Jesus the words, My mother and I redeemed the world together as if from one heart. Well, this leads us to the 19th century and the beginning of the great popes, the great Marian popes, Pius IX and Leo, and then Pope St. Pius X and Pius XI, Gregory, uh, excuse me, uh, Benedict the Fifteenth, all of whom are bringing this tradition to us. Uh, Benedict the Fifteenth will say that is right to say it is right to say that Mary redeemed the human race together with Christ. Pius XI will call Mary the co-redemptrix on three occasions, bringing us even to the contemporary era, St. John Paul II. Seven times St. John Paul II says that Mary is co-redemptrix. He literally says Mary is spiritually crucified, but her role as co-redemptrix doesn't cease with the glorification of her son. That means it continues now. Now, my friends, if all of that was not enough of the church, of scripture, tradition, who we are as Catholic, underscoring the importance of proclaiming the sufferings of the mother, then on the top, as a, a, a supernatural confirmation, then we have the whole Marian message to the modern world. Ruta Bach, 1830, Our Lady is standing under the head of the serpent. Her hands are outstretched in the prayer. She's called on as a as, uh, Pray for us who have recourse to thee as, as the advocate, co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate from the beginning of this Marian age. 
Then at Fatima, she calls all of us to offer our sufferings, make of everything you can a sacrifice, and offer it to the Most High God. Amsterdam, 1945, she comes and specifically says she desires, and this dozens of times, my friends, she desires a papal proclamation of her role as corridentrix, mediatrix, and advocate, and further specifies that only with this proclamation will she then be able to intercede and bring us true peace for the world. My friends, are we hearing that? And if we're hearing it, are we, are we digesting what the mother of Jesus is saying to you and to me now? Again, she literally says that unless the Pope proclaims the truth of the mother's suffering, the co-redemptrix, as well as her roles as mediatrix of all grace and advocate, unless he does that, we will not receive the peace promise of Fatima. Not my words, her words. If we want even further confirmation, we go to Japan. We go to Akita, where a statue of the Lady of All Nations, the image of Our Lady at Amsterdam, weeps 101 times, five times in front, in the very presence of the bishop. The sisters in this monastery in Akita had been daily praying the prayer of the Lady of All Nations, a prayer which is specifically given for the proclamation of the dogma for years. Then all of a sudden, Our Lady begins to speak through the statue of the Lady of All Nations. Can you see why the bishop who approved the apparitions, the, the, the mystical events of Akita, would say that Akita is the continuation of Amsterdam? And Akita forewarns of a great and, I think, honestly, a frightening, in itself, chastisement, saying that something greater than the flood approaches us if we don't convert. So, my friends, I ask you to take it as a whole. Take the whole history of Scripture, tradition, the magisterium, the Marian message of the modern world, to make your, your most in, in, informed decision does heaven want this truth proclaimed? Does heaven want the sufferings of the mother proclaimed? Scripture and tradition and the magisterium and the prophetic Marian message of the modern world all anchor together for a resounding yes. Now, once again, why? Why, for example, is it so important to proclaim this? Well, there's many theological reasons, but let, let's just center on this one. And let's use, once again, Scripture as our example. Remember how Jesus wanted the truth about him proclaimed by Peter. Who do they say that I am? Matthew 16 begins, 13 and, and following, all the way through 20. Who do they say that I am? Did Jesus not know who he was? Of course he did. He wanted it proclaimed by a free human being. And, thanks be to God, Simon does it. Simon becomes Peter, and we get the papacy. It's happening again right now, my friends. Jesus wants a human being to proclaim the truth about his mother, and it happens to be a successor of St. Peter. He wants the Holy Father. He wants the Vicar of Christ to proclaim the truth about the mother's suffering freely. God's not going to force grace, and he's not going to force a pope to say something against his desires. But it's also true for heaven to articulate and to promulgate its desire, its manifest will, that the Vicar of Christ would pronounce the truth about Mary. And it's also fair that heaven would make the graces of the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary contingent on such a proclamation. First of all, it's because Our Lady deserves it. It's hard for us as fallen human creatures to not have kind of an intrinsic selfishness uh, that in a certain sense it's always all about us. Well, in this sense, it's first about her. Heaven wants truth proclaimed. Heaven wants supernatural, heroic, once-in-all-history truth proclaimed. 
That's what happens when we proclaim the truth about Our Lady. In all history, there will never be a creature who was more obedient and who suffered more for the, for the mission of Jesus than Mary. And guess what, my friends? Jesus is not jealous about his mission. Jesus wants others to participate in his mission. He wants you to participate in his mission. He's not jealous to be, well, I'm the redeemer. I'm the sole redeemer. I'm the only one who has anything to do with anybody being saved. That's not the Jesus redemption. It's, I am the first redeemer. I'm the only divine redeemer because that's truth. But out of mercy, I want you to participate in my greatest act. I want you to share in my sufferings. I want you to do what St. Paul did. In Colossians 1.24, I want you to make up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. Mary does it like no other creature, angel or saint. God wants it acknowledged. God wants us to revere her for, her, for it. God wants us to have a gratitude in our heart. And as the hymn we started this with, God wants us to have the maturity to say, Mother, to the extent that I can, let me share too. Let me participate in redemption. I can't go back in time to Calvary, but I can do it now. I can do it by living the Fatima message to make of everything I can accept the suffering, every suffering I can, a, 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 a sacrifice united to yours. I can make up what is lacking the sufferings of Christ in the sense of further releasing these graces. First, it's to acknowledge the truth about Our Lady. Second, it's because we need right now a concrete, dynamic, unquestioned example of human redemptive suffering. That's the mother. Whether it be COVID for us, whether it be even getting over the loss of a loved one through COVID, whether it be unemployment, whether it be family breakdown, whether it be a new temptation towards depression and despair in light of what we're doing, we know the laundry list of possible sufferings. Heaven knows the answer how we can do it better. Number one, we proclaim Our Lady in a solemn dogma as Heaven asked, and she releases the graces for us to do it in, in a new heavenly united way. Number two, we need a concrete example of how to suffer well. I knew a woman, a very wonderful woman, who lost her child at age 12 to leukemia. And as everyone was trying to encourage her, she, she whispered to a friend, none of this is helping. The only thing that helps me is when I sit and stare at the Pieta. Because I know that woman, that mother knows what I'm going through. Well, we might have our own cross right now, where only staring at the Pieta will give us that grace. But we need the grace, and that comes through the proclamation, and we need example, and it comes through the same woman. So my friends, I, I ask you to do what Our Lady asks us to do. For example, in the apparitions of Amsterdam, she says, pray daily the prayer of the Lady of All Nations. We're going to end this program by praying that prayer. I ask you to join me. She asks that we would pray it every day. It maybe takes about 25 or 30 seconds. She tells us it has a power before the throne of God we simply cannot comprehend. I, for one, believe her. Pray the prayer of the Lady of All Nations every day. It is a prayer to prepare the world for the proclamation of the dogma. Secondly, petition the Holy Father. Petition him internally by praying for him, for our present Holy Father to make this proclamation, to crown Our Lady, so we can get the graces as soon as possible. But I'd also say, uh, send petitions to our Holy Father. This is the classic Catholic way to let the Holy Father know, this is something I consider to be important. This is something I think Heaven wants us to do. Do your part. This is an eminently Catholic way to respond. Number one, we pray. Number two, we take action. So, we're going to conclude now with the prayer of Lady of All Nations. I ask you to pray this prayer every day for the solemn proclamation of the truth about Our Lady as the co-redemptrix and her roles as mediatrix and advocate, the mother who distributes grace, the mother who protects us in our present era. I also ask you to send a petition to the Holy Father. 
You can even do that online. Go to crownmary.com. You can send a petition in 30 seconds. Ultimately, put it in your heart as something that you want to continue to pray and work for because the mother deserves to be acknowledged for her unique and unprecedented suffering for me and for you, and we need the graces of the triumph. So let's close by praying the prayer of the Lady of All Nations together. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Father, send now your Spirit over the earth. Let the Holy Spirit live in the hearts of all nations, that they may be preserved from degeneration, disasters, and war. May the Lady of All Nations, Mary Corredemptrix and Mediatrix, be our advocate. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for being with us today for Mary Live. This is Dr. Mark Miravalli saying, God bless you all.